Willie Polly Stein was questionable throughout the day, uh, and they listed an illness. And I actually talked to them before the game and was trying to figure out because the gastroenteritis has been running rampant through this right. team this season. So I didn't know if it was a stomach issue or a condition. Um, and from what I was told, it was a cold. And that was on Wednesday, and so he gave it a go Wednesday. Didn't play a ton of minutes, didn't play extremely well on Wednesday. But then to think you travel and on Friday you're not well enough to play. So I'm not exactly sure what it is, um, but it isn't a stomach ailment. But they are going to miss him because they do. And Jerry mentioned it a little bit, and we'll talk about it more later. The rebounding issue for this team right now is huge, and, and obviously Willie's size helps that a little bit. Uh, and by the way, with Ben, have we seen the last of him, you think? This you know, year? I really do. I, I think so because even though it's it's, it's a, a the tip of his right ring finger is is broken. Um, I don't understand at this point. He's in a splint. He's not able to do anything on the floor. I don't see that changing in the near future. And if it does, say it changes, you know, in a couple weeks. At that point, do you want to have him on the floor? Is there any risk of injuring it further? Obviously, I'm not a doctor, but from what I'm seeing, I, I'd be surprised if we oh. see him. Several things have derailed this season, and there seems not to be more strife internally with the coaching staff. Something Sam Amick wrote about uh, in USA Today Sports, and he used the word exile when referencing the relationship with Nancy Lieberman, an assistant coach on George's staff and George Carl, that she essentially is not involved in anything per George Carl's uh, direction, and that was Sam's report. You're around this all the time. Yeah. What do you see? Well, I think there's a couple things to point out. First of all, I think that reports like this, and, and Sam is an excellent journalist. You, you, you can basically take what he is writing as the truth. He's, he's very diligent in sources and what he's reporting. So um, it just tells you right, right there that there's a lot of strife internally on this team. And I think it starts and it goes back to the beginning of the season when we started with rumors about George Carl's job and Nancy's name was thrown out there. And then everything that happened going into the, to the All-Star break with George Carl. Uh, it's his imminent firing, and then he's still here. There's not a lot of trust within this organization, I think, through the coaching staff and up through the management and ownership. But I do know this for a fact. I was speaking with one of the assistant coaches, and uh, they have basically made the coaches' meetings for the front bench coaches anyway. So Anthony Carter, there's a number of people, including Nancy, that are behind the bench coaches, and they have removed, they've just taken them out of those meetings. For whatever reason, I don't know. That hasn't been reported. I just know that they've kind of tightened their inner circle in those coaches' meetings. That was, well, that was a uh, second most allowed by the Kings this year. And yet they get back in the game. Andre Drummond picks up his fourth foul, Katie, and sits down just over the five-minute mark in the third, and the Kings would make their move. And that's what it took, you know, and that's one of the things. Andre Drummond isn't an extremely foul-prone center, so DeMarcus has this ability to put that kind of pressure on guys, and that was the turning point in the game, not to mention the fact that their defense played a major role in them being able to string together stops instead of trying to match bucket for bucket. The scoring has never been the problem for the Kings. They are one of the best scoring teams in the league, both field goal percentage points uh, that they put up on the board. It's the fact that they don't stop anybody. And so when they can string together a, a number of possessions in a row where they can get stops, they have the ability to get back in games, and we've seen them do it this season. But the difference is, is that you have to figure out a way to where you can limit. Every team's going to go on a run. Do you want to allow a team to go on a 10-0 run, or can you limit it to a 6-0 run so that you're not digging yourself these holes so that you can hopefully get a couple stops, get a couple good looks offensively, and keep the game more manageable? He's the ultimate vet. I mean, he came out, did what he was supposed to do. He played, you know, big minutes. And I, I, it's, I can't make sense of who plays and who doesn't and how long and how little because Seth, you know, Curry, Seth Curry plays three minutes um, in very limited amount of time. And you know what? They were having a hard time containing dribble penetration and, and defending the guards. Um, and Coach has, has continually said that he is one of their best, if not their best, perimeter defender. I don't necessarily agree. I think that Darren Collison has probably got the edge on him there. But he does. He keeps guys in front of him. He doesn't play. Marco Bellinelli comes out after being injured, and he plays 17, 18 minutes, right. goes one of six from the floor, struggling offensively. So I don't know. I can't make sense of it. I don't know if it's a matchup thing or if it's just how he feels. As he says, the personality of the game takes on its own form. And which only shines the light on the impressiveness 
Every time we see Karan Butler, it certainly feels unpredictable, yes. and he has been able to perform in those situations. And, and to your point, man. we did see some of the video here where he's not on the floor, he's got the shooting shirt on, but yeah. he's the first guy off the bench. Yeah. Let's go back and look at your keys to the game before the game because they were uh, very, very indicative, as it turns out. The battle of the boards. Yeah, negative 14 there. And the one that sticks out to me the most is just the offensive boards. I mean, they were out-rebounded on the offensive glass 16-7. to mm. And you know that Detroit is the best team in the league at doing this. So you know you're going to have to bring your guards down to get help. And I thought there was times where the Kings did it really well, but then they lapsed, you know. And then we all saw the first half in terms of three-pointers. Um, they did a great job in the second half. I mean, Marcus Morris, six of six right. in the first half, doesn't even take an attempt in, in the second half of the game. And the Kings defensively changed things so that they had to go to something else. They made them have to go away from their three ball. Um, they didn't knock them down because they had hands in their face, but they did hit them when they mattered. Yeah. And, yeah. To you, and to your point, Katie, in terms of uh, offensive rebounding, tonight Detroit – had 20%, nearly 20% of their points came on second chance points. 21 of their uh, points on second chance points. Today. Am I surprised? Absolutely not. It's their bread and butter. I mean, that's Andre Drummond is in that game, and like I said before, he is, he stays in his lane. He knows exactly what his purpose is. He's there to rebound, defend, so that they can, you know, I will say this Detroit is a really good three-point defensive team and when you break that down and you look at their numbers and, and how they do a great job of of holding teams to a low number of threes low percentage you're like okay how do they do it well right. they run out at three-point shooters why because you have Andre Drummond sitting back there in the lane they force him inside so he does exactly what he's supposed to do he rebounds he has his little hook shots within five feet of the basket he gets his second chance points steady Eddie Andre Drummond and you know what I'm shocked that, especially down the stretch, no hack a, hack a drumming. I mean, Again, like, you mentioned that previously. Yeah, it's like you can go to it. This isn't something Atlanta. That, the yeah, night. oh, Atlanta changed the whole game. I mean, they went on a 16 2 run in the third quarter as soon as they went to hack a drumming and he had to take them out. So this isn't something, you know, coaches are, are, are back and forth on this. I don't think George Carl is a huge fan of it. Neither is Greg Popovich, by the way, but he uses it with frequency until they change trying the rules. Yeah, game. you're trying to win the games. I'm here with Rajan Rondo. Now, Rajan, the first Kings win in Oklahoma City in 15 tries. Just talk about kind of what that means to be able to come out here and do the impossible, it seems like. Uh, well, it's big for our franchise. It's big for our team. Uh, we've been struggling on the road, and to come out and set the tone with a great start and the first road win is good for our team. Look like DeMarcus, especially early, the big guys, they got going rim running. How much easier does that make your job in terms of conducting this offense? Well, a lot easier. It helps out our floor spacing and get those bigs in foul trouble. Next up, Dallas. They've lost to New Orleans and uh, Miami since they beat the Warriors, but a team that you're very familiar with. What do you guys need to do to be able to get your first win in the second night of a back-to-back -back against a very good Dallas team? Uh, just be solid with our, with our turnovers. Um, be solid, clean up the glass, and um, the rest will take care of itself. All right, Rondo, great game tonight. Thank you for your time. Well, Grant, this OKC Dallas back-to-back -back is the Kings' ninth set of back-to-back -back games this season. And the second night of these have given Sacramento plenty of problems. And the strength of schedule hasn't necessarily been in their favor. All three of their games against the defending champs came in the second night of a back-to-back. -back. And just two of those, uh, or just one of those second-nighters was a home game. Now, winning on the road in the NBA is hard enough, but George Carl says he's always felt that your head and your heart factor in even more on the back-to-backs because your body will be fatigued. Now, with the addition of the multiple injuries that you just mentioned tonight, Carl will go deeper into his rotation and says he'll need a wild card off the bench. Thanks for joining us back inside Sleep Train Arena where the Warriors have a 12-point lead here in the fourth quarter. And a lot of it comes by no surprise because of their success from beyond the arc. Now, they lead the NBA in every three-point field goal category that there is. But the thing about it tonight is that normally the Kings' problems defending the three ball comes from their turnovers and in transition. And that has not been the case here tonight. The Kings have been struggling to defend the pick and roll. That was a mistake by Quincy Acey to double down on Clay Thompson right there. But Jerry, it's a good sign for the Kings that Bellinelli and Collison are starting to get something going from three-point range, but they absolutely have to limit the three-point field goals by the Warriors in the rest of this quarter. 
All right, DeMarcus, let's talk about the start first. Last night, disappointed in how you guys came out against the Pelicans, but you came out very strong here in Utah. Came out strong, but we finished. We finished the way that we shouldn't still be playing. You know, uh, we're having these ups and downs this season, and we continue to make the same mistakes. We, we as a team, we have to realize what we're doing or we're going to continue to have this up and down season. We can't continue to have these same mistakes. We, we played the right way in the beginning, then we let up, and all we cared about was offense. And that's how we let Utah back in this game. All right, you no, got. There was no reason we should have been in this type of game. You guys get up by 18, like you're talking, getting out to that big lead. You had to know at some point that Utah was going to be able to make a push. What was it that got you over the edge? Rudy hit that big shot. What was that about? Uh, big shot by Rudy. Um, I think he stayed poised. Uh, you know, I think Rondo made a good option. It was, you know, me or Rudy, and he, he went with a good option with Rudy, and he had a big shot, big shot for the scene. All right, a scary moment there with about a minute 20 left in the game. You go down, you have that left ankle turn. Just how are you feeling at this moment? Uh, I mean, it's a little weak right now, but uh, I bet to give you a better uh, feeling on it in the morning. All right, so next up, the Clippers, who are very hot right now. How do you continue and build on the momentum from this game? The way we played in the first half, that's the team we got to be the entire game. Like you said, they're playing great basketball right now, and uh, we got to come in and play at that level. All right, DeMarcus, thanks for your time. Alex Pavlovich. Now, Alex, I got to ask you, they made, you go back to last night's game and the final six innings going with no hits, go into the top of the seventh today, having struggles at the plate. Hunter Pence ends that. I'm curious, in your opinion, is this offense just slumping, maybe a little unlucky, or both? A little bit of both. Uh, you know, it's been most of the second half that they've been this way, and, and they do feel every day like they're going to come out of this. And, and guys, I asked a bunch of guys in there, they are still optimistic. They still feel like they're having good at bats. I, I think today you saw a lot of line drives, but ultimately you have to look at that big number, which was 40 consecutive at bats without a hit from last night to tonight. And, and really, it was Hunter Pence who has done most of the damage in the series. So I think even though they do feel like they're having good at bats, there is something missing there. What can Bruce Bochy and this offense do to get things going a little bit offensively in a very critical month of September? It's not much because they're healthy right now. I think that's the big issue. You look at these guys, they're all healthy. They're all out there. All his position players, they're ready to go. He's mixed them around a little bit. He's moved Pence around a little bit. He's moved Panic. He gave Brandon Belt the day off today. But those are the guys he's going to stick with. Those are guys who have huge contracts, who have all-star games in their past. I think these are the guys that are going to be out there in September. They just have to find a way to get it done. And, and really for about six, seven weeks now, they haven't been able to do that. We saw very visible signs today of frustration from Eduardo Nunez. We've seen it recently with Buster Posey. I'm curious, in your opinion, are we starting to see the physical manifestation of some frustration uh, from this team? Yeah, absolutely, and, and not just those two guys, but Brandon Crawford said he may or may not have broken his helmet today, too. He, he had some frustration after those first two lineouts. So you're seeing guys who normally don't show it. Posey, especially Crawford, too, does a good job of hiding it on the field. But I, I think behind closed doors today, there was a lot of frustration from him, and, and it is starting to show. It, it's been a long road for these guys in the second half. They're still in position to make the postseason, but I, I think they've been waiting at least a month now for this to turn, and it still hasn't. You've got... Madison Bumgarner and Arietta on the mound tomorrow. Uh, for Madison, as you're kind of winding down the season, do you think it's time for him or important maybe for him to start shifting gears a little bit looking towards the postseason?